thank you very much, uh, Juancho, for the kind introduction again. And thank you for staying. I'm going to try to keep it short. Uh, I know everyone is hungry. You have heard a lot from Dr. Barbara Lawrence about the luteal phase. Uh, it would be some similarities with the previous presentation, but there will be hopefully also some new evidence that you have not seen yet. Luteal phase defect can be based on your endocrine profile if you have low progesterone, but basically the correct diagnosis if you do an endometrial biopsy and you have an out of phase endometrium by more than two days. All stimulated cycles have a luteal phase defect, and the reason is because you increase the level of your steroids and you crash back immediately again. And we know that the corpus luteum is important because if you remove the corpus luteum and you don't supplement the luteal phase, the patient will have a miscarriage. But if you remove the corpus luteum and you supplement with progesterone, the pregnancy will continue. The progesterone itself is working on endometrium and it's working on myometrium. Why is myometrium important? Because it reduces the contractibility of the muscle of the uterus and it increases also the implantation rate because you reduce the contractions of the uterus. Why seven weeks? Because seven weeks you have the luteal placental shift. And what is the reason of luteal phase defect? It's simply because we increase the levels of steroids. If you increase the levels of steroids, what you do, you generate a negative feedback, suppressing your LH, and by suppressing your LH, you will have a luteal phase defect. Now, why is LH important for the luteal phase? If you take a look at this picture, which was published by our good friend Marco Filicori many, many years ago, you see that in the luteal phase, you need to have a certain frequency and a certain amplitude of LH activity. So if you look at this slide, you will see in the beginning of the luteal phase, just after the ovulation, you have a lot of LH production. If you go further in the luteal phase, you see it becomes less. And towards the end of the luteal phase, it's almost none. So if you have a lack of LH, because your LH is completely being suppressed, what will happen? The patient will start bleeding. On the other side, if the patient becomes pregnant, what will happen? The ACG, which is being produced by the trophoblast, will supplement this lack of LH. Now, you might ask, why do we have a lack of LH? We have seen it's because of ovarian stimulation. On the other side, we have published a paper describing the lack of LH in all stimulated cycles. How to solve the issue? Simple. You administer progesterone for the luteal phase support. But how do you administer the progesterone? I am sure if I would ask each one of you what is the best mode of administration of progesterone, I would receive many, many different answers. Do you administer intramuscularly, subcutaneously, vaginally, orally, rectally, maybe in the ear or somewhere? So there are various possibilities of administering progesterone. But what is the best mode of administration? Very often we hear intramuscular is the best. We hear intramuscular is the best. And we know it's very painful. If you give progesterone intramuscularly, it's extremely painful. There is an oil inside, it increases the body temperature. It has to be administered by a nurse or by a physician. It's very painful. Then you might say, yes, but women have to suffer if they want to get pregnant. Is it true? Do they really have to suffer to get pregnant? I don't know. Is it really better to administer intramuscular progesterone? Is it really superior to vaginal progesterone, for example? Moreover, we know that it is not FDA approved and there have been several cases of acute eosinophilic pneumonia, which means women who went to intensive care unit because of the administration of intramuscular progesterone. Women do not have to suffer because if you compare the outcome with vaginal and intramuscular progesterone, the outcome is exactly the same. 
There is no difference. But then you might say, ha, you didn't see this beautiful paper which was published a couple of months ago in the Journal of Fertility Sterility. Yes, I have seen it. This paper concluded that intramuscular progesterone is superior to vaginal progesterone. A simple and to the point conclusion. So what we have said up to now seems to be wrong. Is it? And I brought this paper just to show you that once you read the paper, be critical. Don't accept what is just in the conclusion. Don't follow a dogma. Be critical and read and try to critically understand if that study has been published. Not all studies which have been published in top journals are top studies, except in RBM Online. But for the rest, actually, we need to be critical. Why do you think this study has its pitfalls? Now, I just copied the study design of that study. So basically, one group, it is intramuscular progesterone starting day one, uh, vaginal progesterone starting day one to day five. It means day one, day two, day three, day four, four day five. The patients had for five days vaginal progesterone. And you have here intramuscular progesterone day one to day six. So it means one group received progesterone for five days, the other group received progesterone for six days. So now we seem to have two variables. Because if you do a randomized control trial, you try to have one variable, X or Y. And everything else you unify. But here you are dealing with two variables. The days of progesterone exposure. If you take a look at the endometrial receptivity and all the studies which were conducted on gene expression model, what did they do? One, two, three, four, five, six days. So in order to have a receptive endometrium, you need to have six days of progesterone exposure. So something seemed to be wrong here. So one group is having five days of vaginal progesterone. The other group is having six days. So already we have one day difference. OK. But it doesn't stop here. It goes further than that. We, in our clinics in Abu Dhabi, Dubai, and Muscat, we love the natural cycle, because I think we can learn a lot from the natural cycle. What happens when you have an ovulation? When you have an ovulation, you have an LH, FSH rise, estradiol drop, and your progesterone increases, and you have for six days of progesterone exposure be before you are on day five having your blastocyst transfer. If you administer progesterone vaginally or orally, let's take vaginally, you see that you have an exposure after approximately two hours, 10, 12 nanograms per ml. So after a couple of hours, two hours, you reach around 10 to 12. Of course, you have some vaginal absorption, and that will take up to 46 hours. On the other side, if you administer progesterone intramuscularly, what will happen within minutes, within minutes, you have a systemic absorption. So not only you have differences in the days of exposure, you have also differences in the absorption of the progesterone. Now you tell me, is this study biased? I think it is. Because you are looking into many, many variables. Moreover, if you take a look after women get pregnant, this is a beautiful study which was conducted by Bob Casper's group in Canada. They looked into the endocrine profile of women who were pregnant, receiving vaginal progesterone as compared to intramuscular progesterone. And as you can see, with vaginal progesterone after being pregnant, the levels of serum progesterone were significantly higher. It means the intramuscular progesterone is suppressing the corpus luteum function. Would that be your first choice? I don't know. 
If you administer progesterone vaginally, obviously you have various forms of progesterone. You have capsules, you have crinone the gel that you can administer. This is, for example, crinone, and within four hours, you seem to have a good absorption. And studies have shown that actually once daily is sufficient to supplement the luteal phase in a stimulated cycle. And this is actually simplifying the luteal phase for women. And it seemed to be the preferential delivery to the endometrium due to its bioadhesive formula, which is present in the crinone gel. Now, how do we support the luteal phase? Maybe we should support it with oral instead of putting something into the vagina. Why do we not use oral progesterone? Because if you take oral progesterone, it is broken down to its compartments, and once it's broken down to its compartments, it's no more active. And we know from Claire Bourguin and Paul de Fruy many years ago that the endometrium has a lack of secretory transformation. We have oral digestion, which is a retroprogesterone having some progestative activity, and it's not being broken down to its compartments. On the other side, studies have shown from India, especially from Calcutta, that basically you might compare that with vaginal progesterone. Now, there have been other studies from the same group published in FNS, stating again vaginal oral digesterone seem to be similar. And more recently, we have the LOTUS trial. More recently, we have the LOTUS trial. And this is again a trial which was multicentric, phase three, comparing oral digesterone with vaginal progesterone. And the conclusion was, it's as good as. But again, I want to bring your attention to be critical. To be critical on what? <clears throat> Excuse me. To be critical, even if you have a paper in a good journal, that it might be biased. Now, why should this study be biased? Again, if you do a study, you unify everything, your question is, is A better or B? That's how you do a study. This is how I have learned it. Now, that study that I just spoke to you about used different stimulation protocols. Agonist, antagonist, RecFSH, HMG, LH, whatever you want. Give it. Different modes of trigger. Different days of embryo transfer. IVF and ICSI. No endocrine profiling on a day of oocyte maturation. So you see how many bias we are dealing with here? You don't have one variable. You are dealing with many variables, but you draw conclusions. Can you draw conclusions with so many bias? I don't know. The same study, I mean, just to show you mistakes which happen. We know that estrogen makes endometrial proliferation. That's what estrogen does. Progesterone makes secretory transformation. That's what progesterone does. The introduction of that paper in human reproduction, progesterone promotes endometrial proliferation. This is not what progesterone does. This is what estrogen is doing, not progesterone. Again, to show you to be critical if you read a paper. We published this paper many years ago, comparing oral digesterone with the same patients with vaginal progesterone. And as you can see, this is an in-phase endometrium, this is an out-of-phase endometrium. You have here no mitotic ac activity, you have no vacuoles, secretion, and stromal edema, and here you don't have that. This is the same patient, by the way. Now, can we add estradiol to progesterone for luteal phase support? Yes, you can, but there is no benefit. Can we give ACG? Yes, you can, but it increases the risk of OHSS. When do you start progesterone? You can start it at any day, the day of ACG, egg retrieval, day three or day five. The best seems to be starting on the day of pickup and continue, but continue for how long? Until ACG is positive, seven weeks, 12 weeks, or the whole pregnancy? The answer is you can stop when the ACG is positive. Do we do that? No, we continue up to seven weeks for the sake of our own mind. 
Do we prevent a miscarriage by prolonging the progesterone administration? No, we don't. We, what we do, we pro postpone a miscarriage. Can we use a GnRH agonist for the luteal phase support? Yes, we can. That we have published a couple of years ago in human production update because the blastocyst and the endometrium do have GnRH agonist receptors. Interesting topic, and I think Dr. Barbara Lawrence spoke about that, is the agonist triggering. What happens? You reduce the risk of OHSS, but you have a severe luteal lysis as we have published that a couple of years ago. Your endometrial profiling gene expression changes completely. How can you rescue that with low dose of ACG? But despite that, you will face patients who will develop ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. Now, we were looking into the different pattern of luteolysis. So we thought we let women undergo luteolysis prior rescuing them with low dose of ACG. And we came to that idea because we published the first case of OHSS after agonist triggering, and we thought by ourselves, not everyone is having a luteolysis. If everyone would have a luteolysis, you would not have an OHSS after the agonist triggering. So knowing that, we started a couple of case series where we described not everyone is having the same luteolysis pattern, and Dr. Lawrence published this paper in PLOS One, where she described a huge pattern of variety of luteolysis among women. We took patients with the same number of follicles, with the same number of eggs, and we followed up the pattern of luteolysis after agonist triggering, and we saw that the pattern of luteolysis differs significantly. And this is what I call individualization. Not everyone is the same. People not only look different, the receptors, the endocrine profile of human body differs significantly. So we looked further with Dr. Lawrence on the pattern of luteolysis, how far you can go prior giving ACG to rescue the luteal phase, and we came out to a value of approximately 15 nanogram per ml. Not only the time can be individualized, but also the dose of ACG can be individualized, as you can see in this paper, which was published a couple of months ago. If you are interested to read more about this topic, we published a couple of reviews um, about this topic with our good friends uh, Shahar Kol and Peter Humaydan. Um, and the latest is actually a paper which is in press in fertility sterility, which we gave our thoughts on simplifying the luteal phase in ART. I think we all agree that the moment we start stimulating women, we need to supplement the luteal phase. Intramuscular subcutaneously, of course, they are efficient, but they are not superior to vaginal, and they should not be the first choice. Oral progesterone seems to be promising, but personally, I think we need more studies to reconfirm those data. The length of the luteal phase might be shorter than what we are doing today. No benefit of a stradial co-administration for the luteal phase support. And we need further data to confirm the possible benefit of oral digestion. With an agonist triggering for the final oocyte maturation, patients will undergo a severe luteolysis, but that luteolysis should be used to prevent late OHSS. So what we propose to do is a personalized luteal phase support, or the so-called luteal coasting. The luteal coasting, you let the patients undergo luteolysis. Once the luteolysis reaches a certain pattern, 15 to 20 nanogram per ml, then you administer the low dose OACG. And this is what we call the luteal coasting or personalized luteal phase support. Thank you very much, and it's time for lunch. Thank you.